This morning we are continuing our series on the book of Hebrews. If you've been with us the last several weeks, you realize that this is not one of the easiest books to read or understand, right? It's, it's complicated. It's one of those books that people usually don't read. There's a lot of archaic language in here. There's a lot of old customs in here. There's a lot of things that we in the 21st century have trouble relating to compared to where they were living. But I promise you, if you stick with us during this series, if you dig into the riches that are in this book, that this book has to offer, the results will be tremendous in your life. So far in this letter, the writer has what the writer has done is he's tried to convince his readers that Jesus is worth everything or that, that they have. He's worth whatever suffering and ridicule that they face as a result of following him. He's actually worth it. When we get to the beginning of chapter 2 of Hebrews, he encourages them not to drift away from their faith, not to drift away from this great salvation. The church in Rome, this small church, was facing passive dangers and active dangers on a daily basis. The active dangers were the dangers of ridicule, of embarrassment, of shame, of abandoning their faith. All of these things that occurred to them as a result of following Jesus. But there were passive dangers as well. There were passive dangers that this church was facing. The passive danger of just going through the motions of your faith and slowly drifting away from Jesus. The writer says that you don't want to miss this great salvation. This salvation that's been offered to you is so incredible. It's so rich. It's so marvelous. You don't want to miss it. The writer says you want to drop anchor here. You want to stay grounded here. You want to stay close to Jesus. You want a relationship with Jesus. He is better than you can ever imagine. Last week, we saw that he began to describe how great the salvation is. Well, he began to tell them that Jesus, as a result of what he did on the cross, not only forgives us of our sins and restores us into relationship with Christ, but there's also future ramifications for this, because we will be restored to the glory that we had before sin entered the world. We will be restored back into relationship with God. We will live on the earth like we were supposed to live, and we will rule this earth instead of the earth ruling us. God accomplishes this by sending Jesus, and the writer says that he became a little lower than the angels. But he also dies on our behalf. The writer says he tastes death. See, here's the benefit of following Jesus. Now, here's what the writer anticipates. He talks about how great this salvation is. He talks about how marvelous Jesus is. He talks about all that Jesus has done, but he knows what the readers are going through. The readers are hearing these incredible things and excites them. They come on a Sunday morning and hear the pastor reading this letter and encourages them about their future. But when the closing prayer is done and the benediction is done and they're done hanging out with their brothers and sisters and they walk out the door, they realize they're walking out into a world that's full of pain, a world that's full of suffering, a world that's full of grief. It's great to be told that there's something great that's going to happen to them in the future. But right now it's painful. Right now it's difficult. Right now it's challenging. And what they heard was great. I'm glad there's a future reality that's going to happen. But right now, I don't feel like a king at all. In fact, I feel like a jester or a fool. Right now, I don't feel like I rule over the world. In fact, I feel like everything is ruling over me or kicking my butt on a daily basis. Our family members rejected us. The government is persecuting us. And on a daily basis, we are facing the risk of losing our lives all because we believe in Jesus. Everything the writer says sounds wonderful, but that's not reality. Doesn't God see where they're going, what's going on in their lives on a daily basis? So the writer anticipates these objections, and he answers them in one of the most startling and one of the most amazing passages in the entire Bible. He's going to pull together things in our passage this morning from the Old Testament. He's going to pull all of these pieces together and form this beautiful picture of who God is for us right now in the midst of our suffering because of Jesus. And what the writer is going to do is he's going to turn from the future idea of salvation of what's going to happen to us to the very practical of where we are today. He's going to step into their shoes. He's going to feel their pain. He's going to relate to them what God wants them to know right now in the midst of the suffering and pain that they are experiencing. What I'm going to do this morning is a little different from our normal outlines. The outline that I posted online is going to be in the form of what these people were feeling or what these people were experiencing and how the writer responds to them. And what we're going to see this morning is that this church in Rome 
They feel embarrassed for their faith. They feel ashamed for what they've lost. They feel scared to die. They feel tempted to quit. All of those things, all of us have felt either at some point in our life, maybe we feel it right now, or we will feel at some point in our lives. So these are the four things I want to look at. The church feels embarrassed for their faith, ashamed for what they've lost, scared to die, tempted to quit. Let's look at the first one. They are embarrassed for their faith. Here's a setting. You've ever been ridiculed for your faith? If you're, ever, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, you probably have, right? You've been made fun of or mocked at or laughed at because of what you believe. All of us in this room have. Maybe not directly. Maybe not someone hasn't come to you and said, ah, you're a fool for what you believe. But you've sat in a room where people say, you really believe well, Jesus is the only way to heaven? Or what about all these other good people that live on the earth? They're, they're saying they're going to hell. Where they've made some kind of comment that belittles our faith. These guys in this church in, in Rome are facing ridicule, embarrassment for their faith. You can imagine them walking out of church that Sunday morning, the previous Sunday, talking about how great it's going to be for them in the future, and imagining them ruling the earth one day, that these Roman authorities that are persecuting them, one day they will be under their feet. You can imagine the joy that they feel. Imagine them trying to share this with their Jewish friends and families as they're trying to witness about Jesus and saying, listen, when Jesus comes back, so we're going to be rulers over this earth. Can you imagine their Jewish friends and family mocking them, ridiculing them, laughing at them? Because at the present time, this group of believers, they're not kings. They're not rulers. In fact, they're the outcasts. They're the nobodies of society. They're the ones that everyone has rejected. The idea of Jesus tasting death, what the writer talks about, was not a popular idea in that culture. It's still not a popular idea even in our culture. The idea of a suffering God was very countercultural to everyone that was around them. Most of these guys in this church were from a Jewish background. Think about their families. Think about the people that they grew up with. They wouldn't entertain for a second the idea that a holy God dying on a cross. They would never entertain that thought. They would never accept that. It was completely inappropriate for them. In fact, it was blasphemous to say that a holy God would die. They would never accept that. On top of that, the notion that not just did God die, but that he actually died on a cross. The Jewish, belief, the Jewish people thought that the cross was a sign of God's curse. Now to say that God himself was cursed and died on a cross... You can imagine their friends, their family would never accept this idea. You've got to understand, during this time when Jesus was around, there were a ton of other messiahs that were popping up on the scene. Jesus wasn't the only one that claimed to be the messiah. Many of these messiahs were popping up, and they were saying that they would deliver the Israelites from the Roman bondage. Many of them also died for their beliefs. Many of them were executed. Some of them were even crucified. Jesus wasn't the only one. They all had followers. They all had disciples. However, when all of these other messiahs died, when they were executed, their followers, their disciples, actually gave up the revelation. They abandoned whoever died and went to the next messiah that was still living. They just kept going from one messiah to the next messiah. So you can imagine these group of believers in Jesus after Jesus has died, they still haven't given up on Jesus. They're still professing Jesus. They're still saying Jesus is the way. And their family and their friends are saying, just give it up already. Just abandon him. He's dead. He's gone. Move on. There is someone else that will come and deliver us from Rome. But move on from Jesus. They didn't understand why these believers were still holding on to Jesus. The Apostle Paul talks about this when he writes to the church in Corinth. He says, we preach Christ crucified. He's a stumbling block. To the Jews. That's exactly what he was. Jesus made the Jews angry. The idea that a holy God could come and die makes them mad. That's the Jewish side. Remember, these guys were living in Rome, a very Gentile city. Now imagine on the flip side what the Gentiles felt like, the non-Jews felt when they heard this message. They were actually more against us than the Jews were. It didn't make them mad. 
It actually, they just laughed and ridiculed the idea. It was a ridiculous concept that Jesus would come, that God would come and become a man and suffer and die. It was a completely foreign concept to them. Remember, in common in Greek thought was the idea that the body was evil, the soul was good. So the goal of life was to be separated from the body. So the idea that God, who was already separate from human body, would actually take on human flesh was completely opposite to their worldview. The gods of the pantheon never even cared about the human beings. So it would be crazy to think that they would come and even talk to humanity. In their minds, God was apathetic and detached from humanity. And here's Christians coming in and saying, no, that's not God at all. He's actually interested and he cares and he identifies with humanity. Completely opposite worldviews. Remember the passage I read? Jesus is a stumbling block for the Jews. But the passage ends, it says, he's a folly to the Gentiles. They laugh at it. They ridicule it. He, it's laughable to them. So this group of believers, they're ridiculed, they're insulted, they're laughed at for their faith. And these small group of people in a huge metropolitan community in Rome the Jewish community is in uproar over this, ridiculing Christians for their belief. The Gentile community is laughing, mocking at them for their beliefs. You can imagine why there were many in the church at this time that were saying, is this even worth it? Is it even worth following Jesus? When a world is laughing at us, when a world mocks us for our beliefs, when a world is laughing at us because we identify with a Savior, that, a God that dies, is it even worth it? You can understand why many of them were ready to give up on their faith. So the writer says the following in verse 10, and I want to focus on verse 10 for most of this morning. He says, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Watch what he says here. Look at this verse, and we're going to spend probably most of today on this verse. It's a theologically rich verse right here. And I'm going to unpack this for you. He says, first he says, it's fitting and appropriate for God to do this. The suffering and death of Jesus was a very God-worthy concept. God did, Jesus did what no angel would do, what no angel could do. And just to make sure they understood he, who he was talking about, the writer references Jesus as the creator for whom and by whom all things exist. He's the holy God. He's the only God. He is God. He demonstrates his greatness by becoming a man. The basic argument is this. If you want to see how good and powerful God is, step outside. Look at the stars. Look at the creation. Look at all of this stuff, and you'll see how amazingly powerful and great God is. But if you want to see deeper and more richer and more fuller of how good God is, don't look at just creation. Look at Jesus. Look at how great he is. Look at him, because in him you will see the display of the glory of God. He came to suffer and defeat sin. Why did he have to suffer? Why did he have to die? Why did he have to be persecuted? Because it's in his suffering that we gained a great Savior, as the writer talks about. It was in his suffering that he became the founder of our salvation. What does that mean? What does it mean to say that Jesus is the founder of our salvation? Now, here's where it gets interesting. The word founder there is a word that's packed with insight. Now, I'm going to do something I normally never do, but I'm going to give you a little Greek lesson this morning. And so um, all my three years of seminary, I'm giving it to you right now. So um, the word founder there is the word archagon. Archagon. Um, sounds like one of those Lord of the Rings characters, right? Um, but that's the word there. The reason I say this to you is because whatever translation of the Bible you have this morning, every translation, that word founder is translated differently. Some of you in your Bibles have the word pioneer or hero or captain or leader or author. All of these words are used. In fact, those are the words that are in the various English translations that are there. Why is that? Because you've got to understand that the Greek language is a very poetic language. They have a lot more meaning to them in their words than ours do. You can say one word in the Greek, and it actually can mean six or seven different things in English. So we need to understand what the word actually means. Let me explain the actual word to you, and let me try to illustrate it for you. The basic meaning of the word is someone 
who enters into something in order that others may enter into it, enter into it as well and benefit from it. So someone goes before you and enters into it so that you can follow and you can benefit from the fact that they've gone before you. There's always risk involved. Let's say Lord of the Rings, I just mentioned Frodo with the ring, right? He's the kind of an archer guy. He's the one that goes before. The Dark Knight against the Gotham villains, he's the archer guy. He's the one who goes before and sets the trail. David against Goliath would be a good example of an archer guy. Someone who suffered and risked their lives for the sake, so for, for their sake, so that other people can benefit from it. Martin Luther King would be an example of an archer guy. He set a trail, set, um, did, took a great risk so that other people could benefit from it. All of these people took risks, suffered in order, in order so that others could benefit from their lives. Take rock climbing, for example. I don't know if any of you have ever done it, but an archer gun would be the mountain climber that goes first. He goes ahead of the others. He's chipping away at the rock. He's um, chipping away footholds so people behind him can have somewhere to step on. He's inserting pegs. He's um, extending the rope down for others to follow behind him. He's taking the major risks, and the others are benefiting from his actions. He never stands in the back and just watches. He's always in the front, always leading by example. Our writer says this is what Jesus is like blazing a trail by risking his own life through suffering so that we can follow and we can benefit. Probably the best way to describe it is he's a trailblazer, right? He hacks through the jungle of sin and death and hell and even Satan and blazes a trail through it, through God, to God, so that we could follow. That's what he says in this passage, that he brings many sons to glory. He's hacking away. He's creating a way so that we can get to God. But here's the full picture. It wasn't that he just broke through and created a path and then told us to follow along, and then we follow behind. But that's not what the text, the imagery is showing at all. The actual picture is that Jesus throws us on his back, on his shoulders, and he hacks his way through sin, through death, through hell, and even Satan, and blazes a trail, and brings us to glory. We right now have access to the Father because Jesus threw us on his back and gave us entrance into the kingdom. He defeated what they could never defeat. Jesus achieves for lost humanity what they could never achieve for themselves. He defeated what humanity could never defeat, so we benefit from it. But the writer says there's even more going on here. Jesus couldn't just bark out orders from heaven to us. He had to come down and blaze the trail through suffering and death in order for him to be made perfect, for Jesus to be made perfect. That should create a red light for you, right? Wasn't Jesus already perfect? What's he saying here? Jesus wasn't perfect till he suffered and died? He had to be made perfect? Wasn't he already God? Wasn't he sinless? Wasn't he perfect? Here's another phrase we've got to define. He wasn't lacking perfection by any, me, any moral sense of the word. His suffering that qualified him to be the trailblazer for us. Suffering qualified him to do this for us. Jesus in suffering proved experientially what was already true theologically. Let me illustrate. Imagine you're like a chef, right? You're like one of the best chefs in the world. You graduated from one of the top culinary schools in the nation, and you've even been on the TV shows on the cooking channel. You've got decades of cooking experience. You're an iron chef. Let's Im imagine that. You've cooked for celebrities, for politicians, for royalty. You've met them all. You're famous. Everyone knows who you are. You've got this long resume going on. You've got all of this stuff that you've done. And this company wants to hire you for their business. So you come in for an interview. The owner reads your resume, meets with you, and gets to know you. He says he wants to hire you, and you're excited. But he says, before we do, I want you to go into the kitchen, and I want you to cook me a meal. You immediately object, right? You're like, haven't you read my resume? Haven't you seen who all I've cooked for? Haven't you seen what all I've accomplished? Haven't you seen the TV shows I've been on? Of course I can make a meal for you. Why are you asking me to do this? Check my references. Ask the people I've already made meals for. And the guy replies, 
I can see everything great on paper. I can read all that you've done and all that you're able to do. It's a completely different thing to taste what you've made. Proof is in the pudding. Go make me a meal. Obviously, the man can do that and make him a great meal, but he had to experience and see it firsthand. That's what our text is talking about. Jesus didn't just need to die for the penalty of our sins. He couldn't have just dropped into the earth around 33 years old and just gone and died for us. He couldn't have done that. He had to come and live a life that qualified him to be the person that would die for us. We needed his righteous life, not just his death. We didn't just need someone to die for us. We, needed some, we didn't just need someone to pay the penalty of sin for us. We needed a righteous life to give us someone, something in return. That's why he suffers. That's why later in Hebrews, in Hebrews, it would say things like Jesus learned obedience. He learned what it was like to obey. Wasn't he perfect? Yes, he was. Was he going to obey? Absolutely he was. But he was actually going to have to live that out and learn even obedience. There was nothing in him, there was nothing lacking in him to learn those things, but he had to prove his credentials. And so when he says he was tempted in every manner, we can relate because we've been tempted. And we can look at Jesus and we could say, he's gone through it for us. It's not that he just came and died, but he lived the life that we've lived. He suffered the way we've suffered. He experienced pain. He experienced anguish. He experienced grief. He's experienced people turning their backs on him. He's experienced people that were embarrassed of following him and turning and leaving him. He's experienced abandonment. So we can look at Jesus and say, he didn't just die for us, but he lived. He lived for us as well. So the writer is saying to this church, listen, there's no reason for you to apologize for the cross. You don't have to shove it under the rug because the cross not only saves us, but it magnifies who God is. Far from anything that we should be ashamed of, Christ's humiliation and death for what we should glory in. It's what we should rejoice in. It was the brilliant plan of God to display himself to save us. It was fitting. Suffering and death was the only way that God could reach us. There were no other options. He could have sat in heaven and barked out orders and said, keep trying to obey the law, keep trying to obey the commandments and earn your way to heaven. Do your religious activities and maybe I'll let you in. He could have done that, but the problem was none of us would have ever made it because none of us could have lived the perfect life that was required for it. Instead, God comes down, lives amongst us, becomes a man, lives a perfect life, and dies in our place so that when we stand before God, he doesn't see our filth, he doesn't see our rags, but he sees the righteousness of Christ in our lives. Listen, they benefit from this. We benefit from this. In the mockery they receive, they share with Jesus in his suffering. And he shares in their suffering because he was a man, because he lived this life. Jesus already faced the brunt of the suffering. He already faced the worst of it. How can we feel embarrassed of him or deny him when he has suffered so much for us? There's a pastor that lived around the time of Charles Spurgeon by the name of Charles Simeon. He was a man that pastored a church that actually hated him. They did not like him at all. They mocked him. They threw stones at him. His own church members, right? And he pastored this church for 50 years. Imagine me being your pastor for 50 years and you hated me every single week, showing up here hating me. This is what this guy went through. It would be hard. They didn't like him. He was persecuted by his own community of believers and he experienced a great deal of embarrassment over this time period. One of his friends asked him what keeps him going through all of the shame, through all of the embarrassment, through all of the ridicule, through all of the persecution. He said, my dear brother, we must not mind a little suffering for Christ's sake. When I'm trying to get through a hedge, if my head and shoulders are already safely through, I can bear the little pricklings on my leg. Let us rejoice in remembering that the holy head has surmounted all of his sufferings triumphed over death, and let's follow him patiently because we shall soon be partakers of his glory. The head has already gone through. The greatest suffering has already taken place. We don't need to be embarrassed about him. 
I don't think I have time to hit all of the other points this morning. So I'm going to just kind of focus on this and we'll hit the other three points next week. But let's pause and meditate on this for a second on where we are today. We live in an age where our faith is ridiculed, mocked at, laughed at. Rick Warren, a pastor out in California, he was the pastor that um, prayed at the first inauguration for President Obama. He tweeted the following this week about the culture we live in. He said, a Christian CEO has been bullied. A pastor has been bullied out, out of praying publicly. And today an athlete has been bullied out of speaking at a church. That's the culture that we live in. The owner's Chick-fil-A has been bullied because of his beliefs that marriage is between man and a woman. A pastor by the name of Louis Giglio, who does a lot of incredible things around the world, has been bullied out of praying at the inauguration because of his beliefs that marriage is between a man and a woman. And Tim Tebow this week decided that he wasn't going to speak at a church here in Dallas because the pastor believes that marriage is between a man and a woman. That's the culture that we live in. That's the world that we live in. If you haven't been ridiculed for your faith in Jesus, don't think you're safe because it's going to happen. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. People can't even speak at churches now because of their beliefs. Because if you truly live out your faith, not only will people be drawn in and see Jesus as amazing and wonderful, but you'll also have the other side as well. Because when you truly live out your faith, there will be people that will say, you're a fool. You're an idiot. Why do you believe this? Why do you believe in this superstition? Why do you believe that someone would die for you? Why do you believe that um, heaven is better, that there is a heaven, there is a hell? Why do you believe this stuff? It's, is it silly to believe that Jesus would die for your sins? Is it embarrassing for you to say that you believe what the Bible says, that marriage is between a man and a woman? Does it mortify you to have someone ask you if you really believe that Jesus is the only way? But what about all those other people that have never heard about Jesus? Do you feel embarrassed for your faith sometimes? The writer of Hebrews is trying to encourage this church, trying to encourage you. He's saying Jesus bore the brunt of it all for you. He received the worst of it, and he did it for you, and he did it for me. What you are experiencing is definitely challenging. It can be embarrassing, but Jesus understands. He's been there. He's done it. And he knows exactly what you are going through. Not only that, but the writer reminds us over and over in the book of Hebrews, he'll never leave you. He'll never abandon you. He'll never forsake you. When you are embarrassed for your faith, when you feel like you're embarrassed, when you wonder if it's worth going on, when you wonder if it's true to hold on to what the Bible says in a culture that believes completely opposite, Jesus says, listen, I bore the brunt of it all for you. Bear with it. Keep going. Keep striving. Don't give up. Don't quit. I will not abandon you. I will not forsake you. You will make it through. You will receive your reward. Don't worry. Don't be embarrassed. You feel embarrassed that your faith in Jesus isn't very popular in our culture? Remember, Jesus threw you on his shoulders. He hacked his way through sin, death, hell, Satan, defeated all of it to deliver you and bring you home to glory. You are the sons of glory that he talks about in this verse. Don't be embarrassed. He took the brunt of it all for you. I'll address this more next week as we finish up these verses, but do you see what the writer is saying about suffering here? You know, that old, age-old question, if God is good, why does all this bad stuff happen? Do you realize what the writer is saying in our text? He may not be giving us an answer to why suffering happens, of why we go through the things we go through, but he's clearly saying here that the answer is not that God doesn't care. The answer is not that God doesn't understand, because God does. He entered into it. He walked in our shoes. He identifies with us in our suffering, and that's exactly what's going on. This should bring encouragement to us this morning. This should bring endurance to us to keep going. This morning, maybe you're wrestling with living out your faith for Jesus. How do you boldly live out your faith in a world 
that opposes him. How do you say you're a follower of Jesus to a multicultural world that we live in that believe in various different things? Maybe you're concerned that people, what people will think if they know that you're a follower of Jesus. Maybe you fear what they will say if you point them to Jesus as the way of salvation. Listen, he carried you this far. He'll carry you through all the way to the end. The table that we're about to celebrate, the table that we're about to rejoice in, is a great reminder of God's incredible love for you. It's a reminder to you this morning that God loves you more than you can ever imagine. But it's also a reminder that whatever you are going through this morning, Jesus identifies and knows what you're going through because he suffered on your behalf. He was embarrassed on your behalf. So take care. Be encouraged. Don't be embarrassed. Jesus is better. He's better than what the world will say. He's better than what they will do to you. He's better than what they will say to you. He's better. And the writer encourages them, he encourages you. Jesus is better than anything out there in the world. Live for Jesus. Trust Jesus. Be bold in your faith. Because he will carry you through. As we come to the table this morning, may it remind you of God's incredible love for you. May it remind you that when you could not earn your way to God, he came down for you. He lived the life you should have lived, died the death that you should have died. And as he hung on the cross, he said, Father, punish me. Punish me for all of their sins. Pour on me the wrath that they deserve. Pour it all on me. Let me face the brunt of it all. Treat me as if I lived their life, as if I lived Sam's life. And as you do, as you punish me, would you look at Sam? Would you look at the folks in this room? And would you treat them not the way they deserve, but would you treat them as if they lived my life? Would you treat them as if they lived the perfect life that you had demanded? And would you look at them not as enemies no more, but would you look at them as sons? Would you look at them as daughters? Would you embrace them back into the kingdom? Would you be their father? Would you let them be your children? Would you restore them back into relationship with you? This is what the table speaks to us this morning. This is what the writer of Hebrews is communicating to us this morning. In a world that where we can easily be embarrassed for what we believe, Jesus is better, so much better. Live your life for Jesus, let's pray. Father, this morning, it is hard to live for you. It's hard because this world opposes everything about you. And I don't know if any of us in this room will ever have to risk our lives for the sake of the gospel. But we've been in places where people have ridiculed what we believe in. People mock the idea that God would love us. People would mock the idea that there's even a God. People would mock the idea that we would believe and obey the words of your scripture. We experience that today. We experience that, we experience that in our workplaces. We experience that in our schools, in our classes. Some of us even in this room experience that with our family members. Thank you that you don't just tell us what to do, but you sent Jesus to this earth. You allowed him to experience everything we've experienced. You allowed him to suffer that you identify with us. You know exactly what we go through. You know exactly how we feel. Thank you that you don't just simply tell us and sit away from us, commanding us, 
but you are with us daily. You walk with us. You guide us. You lead us. Our hope is not in how good we are. Our hope is not in how perfect we can live this life. Our only hope is in Jesus. So as we come to this table, we are reminded again that our only hope is Jesus. And we're reminded he is so much better than anything else this world has to offer. We love you. It's in Jesus' name.